Hello, everyone, and welcome to Interactive Brokers, IBKR podcast. I'm joined today with my co-host, Chief Strategist, Steve Sosnick. Pleasure to join you, Jose. Great to see you. Terrific. Nuriel Rubini. Uh, hi, everyone. Great pleasure being on this podcast. And Stephen Moran. Hey, Jose. Great to see you. Thanks for having us. Terrific. Quick bios. Nuriel Rabini is a senior economic advisor to Hudson Bay Capital. Dr. Rabini is also Professor Emeritus, Stern School of Business, New York University, and CEO of Rabini Macro Associates, LLC. From 1998 to 2000, he served as senior economist at the White House Council of Economic Advisors and the senior advisor for international affairs at the U.S. Treasury. He is the author of numerous economics articles and four books. Dr. Rubini received an undergraduate degree at Bocconi University in Milan, Italy, and a PhD in economics at Harvard University. Stephen Moran is senior strategist at Hudson Bay Capital. Previously, Dr. Moran served as senior advisor for economic policy at the U.S. Department of the Treasury, where he assisted with fiscal policy during the pandemic recession. Prior to Treasury, Dr. Moran worked for a decade as an investment professional. Dr. Moran is also an economics fellow at the Manhattan, is Manhattan Institute for Policy Research. He received a PhD in economics from Harvard University and a BA from Boston University. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. So, uh, Nurel, if I can go to you first. So, active tre activist treasury issuance. This research very popular amongst the street. Myself and Steve Sosnick, we spoke about it as soon as you guys released it. Moran and myself were good friends, too. So, initially a lot of issuance going on at the front end of the curve, lacking price discovery on the longer end, suppressing those yields and letting risk assets go, go higher. Can you expand on that, Nuriel? Yes, in this paper that uh, I wrote together with Steve, we showed that for the last few quarters, the US Treasury has radically changed its debt management by issuing a much larger fraction of its debt as short-term bills and issuing less of the longer term debt, it's called coupons. That is implied that effectively is a form of backdoor quantitative easing. When the Fed does quantitative easing, they buy long-term bonds, the price goes up, the yield falls. That's an easing of financial condition that boosts not only asset prices, but also the real economy. Instead, in this case, what the treasury is doing, instead of affecting the demand uh, for treasuries, is affecting the supply. And for any given demand, if you supply less, again, the price goes higher, uh, the yield falls, and that eases financial condition. Now, it's problematic because the Fed has been trying to cool down the economy. Growth was above uh, potential, inflation above target, and it pushed the Fed funds rate uh, to the current level of 5.5. But until recently, the economy has been growing faster than potential in spite of the Fed tightening. And inflation has fallen, but more slowly than the Fed was expecting, and is still by some measure well above the 2% target. Our interpretation is that what the Treasury has done is equivalent in terms of the amount of less issuance of long-term Treasury to a trillion dollar equivalent less of issuance of Treasury. If you look at the literature on quantitative easing, when you do that, it's as if the Fed had cut uh, the Fed funds rate, the policy rate, by 100 basis points, or equivalently that the 10-year Treasury yield is lower by 25 basis points compared to what it would have been without uh, this uh, ATI. So the way we think of what's happened in the economy is the Fed was trying to cool down the economy. The Treasury was worried about maybe a hard landing or something like that, and has undone in partly what the Fed has done through this ATI policy, keeping yields lower, effectively the Fed funds rate lower than what the Fed wants. And that explains why growth has been strong and inflation has remained uh, well above the target of the Fed. So the implication then would be that we would be looking at a yield curve that is no longer inverted. Do you feel that's muddied the signals in such a way that it's the usual recession signal that's given by an inverted yield curve has been neutered by this activity? Sure. We estimate that the effects would be about 50 basis points of higher yield on the 10-year 10 10 year node. 
if Treasury reversed its uh, unconventional issuance policies, a 50 basis point increase would make up about half the distance to uninverting the yield curve, but it wouldn't totally uninvert the yield curve. So when you're talking about 50 basis points in the 10-year yield, that's material, right? Risk assets will notice, markets will notice, yields will notice, the economy will notice, but you're not talking about the type of move that's going to sort of single-handedly create giant economic shock. So one thing I wanted to, what do you think are the medium to long-term costs going on this kind of policy? I mean, I know in your paper, you write about this is sort of the politicization of business cycles. Do you want to expand on that? There's a couple of costs, right? One is that we've been issuing at the most expensive part of the yield curve, right? By issuing a lot of short-term overnight debt in, as, as uh, Sosnick said a moment ago, in, in, an, in a heavily inverted yield curve, we've been issuing at the most expensive place to fund ourselves, right? So interest costs have been higher than if we had issued further at the yield curve. Another cost of doing it is by increasing our exposure to rollover risk, right? If say there's some geopolitical event and the price of oil goes up by $30 a barrel and interest rates go higher when the Fed has to hike again, we now have to, we now have to fund ourselves, roll over the short-term debt that we've rolled over at higher rates. Um, and then there's the political consequences of potentially sort of giving a tool to manage uh, the interest rate cycle, manage the, the, the business cycle away from a sort of taking those powers away from a what is theoretically an independent central bank and giving them more towards sort of politically appointed officials of the Treasury Department. And that falls square, square into an area called political business cycles that Nouriel's written extensively on and really sort of created an entire academic literature on. So I'll let him handle that. I guess going forward then, see, here's the question that I, I have though. Let's take the politics out of it. Let's say I'm managing a corporation here. I might be tempted to borrow money short term rather than locking in long-term rates, even though it would appear advantageous to do so if I think the Fed is going to aggressively cut rates. How much of this do you think is political? How much of it is just, do you think that the treasury is banking on the Fed, regard basically hoping that the independence stays put? Yeah. So first of all, Treasury does not do that, right? It is officially Treasury, official Treasury policy not to try to time the interest rate cycle. It's officially in the, in, in the policy frameworks. Secretary Yellen has reaffirmed this recently in sworn testimony to Congress. So claims that Treasury is doing it to try to, to time the interest rate cycle because they expect Fed cuts are sort of implicit, implicitly suggesting that she perjured herself. Treasury says this is not happening. We don't think this is happening either, principally because you have to get the call right, right? It turns you into someone who's betting against the market. So remember, the way that fixed income works is that the 10-year yield, right, reflects the average expected overnight rate over the course of 10 years, mm -hmm. right? Another way of saying that is that you have to beat the forwards in order to make money in fixed income. You have to beat what's priced into the yield curve already. And if the forwards come true, if the yield curve as it is now is realized, you will not make or lose any money doing 10 years now or just continually ro rolling overnight, right? If the forwards are realized, you will not make or lose any money. You have to beat the forwards, right? So you are implicitly making a bet that the market is wrong, that you are right, that you know better than the market. And Treasury is humble enough to know that's not always a winning, that's not always a winning strategy and that they can get it wrong and that getting it wrong could be enormously costly not only to the taxpayer, but to the financial system as well because of unnecessary volatility in the system. Now, in a market which is already pricing 200 basis points of cuts from the Fed in a 9-12 month period, right? you have to get more than that 200 basis points of cuts in order to make money on, this, on the strategy you just described. right? So the Fed has to cut by, let's say, 250 or 300 basis points in the next nine months, not just 200. That's a quite a tall order and is suggestive. And if Treasury were following the strategy, which they say that they're not, and we believe that they're not, they'd have to they'd have to really be expecting a recession around the corner, in which case there's a whole other set of policies they should be doing that extend far beyond the issuance strategy. Why do it? Then why are they doing this? Well, usually the issuance of shorter term bills is large when there is either a recession or there is a liquidity crisis, or there is a financial crisis, or like in COVID, when we had the, a shock to the markets and you had to issue a lot of debt to finance a temporary, very large uh, budget deficit. So that will be justified. But if you look at the last year or so, 
The economy is growing uh, above potential. There is no financial crisis. There were some ripple effects coming from Silicon Valley Bank, but then they disappeared. Growth is strong. Inflation is still above the target. And there is no other explanation of why they're doing this thing. The claim is not driven by politics, but the reality is there is no other clear explanation. And I think what happened was that last summer, suddenly the bond, the vigilantes woke up even for the United States, first time in a long time, when they realized the deficits were huge in the US, Europe, and advanced economies, and suddenly bonds went much higher. The 10 year treasury reached uh, almost uh, 5%. And I think they went into a panic. They were already worried about the Fed uh, having the Fed funds rate at five and a half and stay high or higher for longer. And they decided to try to ease financial condition by using debt management that, as we point out in the paper, is an indirect form of QE. And by the way, Treasury does not deny that what they're doing has an impact on bond yields and on financial condition. They claim that was not done for political reasons, but there is no other explanation of why they're done it. Really, if it walks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it must be a duck. And I think that they try to ease financial condition because they were worried about a softish landing, a short and shallow recession or a harder landing. And since the Fed was committed to keep the Fed funds rate high or higher for longer, it became a backdoor form of essentially easing financial condition and boosting the economy. At the time, when, however, growth was strong, inflation was too high, and that was not necessary. And, and so if you compare this to what happened during the COVID experience, right? During COVID, in the first quarter, in the first few months of the recession, Treasury issued two and a half trillion dollars of bills, right? Which is totally orthodox debt management policy. You have a real crisis, you issue a lot of bills to fund the government. You don't issue a ton of coupons into the crisis. Okay, it CARES Act is implemented, which I participated a little bit in, and you, the economy starts recovering. Things are okay. In July of 2020, so a mere four months later, Treasury allows bills to start redeeming and starts terming those out into longer term debt. So net bills issuance goes negative in July of 2020, and it stays negative until October of 2021. So five quarters, well over a year, Treasury allows the excess bills to redeem themselves and turn those out into longer term debt. That's orthodox debt management policy. You borrow, in a, you borrow bills in a crisis and then you term them out when things are calmer. Okay, last year we had a spike in financing needs as the debt limit was suspended and Treasury had to rebuild its savings accounts, it borrows in bills, but then over a year later, we're still borrowing excessively in bills, right? We didn't wait three months and then start terming them out. We're still borrowing excessively in bills. And unlike COVID, there is no financial crisis. There is no economic growth crisis. There is no, there is no market fragility crisis. Everything is pretty great. And we're still engaging in emergency measures as if we're in a genuine emergency and we're not. Steve Moran, one word you mentioned earlier was volatility. Steve yeah. Sosnick here is a big volatility guy. We work for Interactive Brokers, a huge pioneer in options trading and volatility and all that kind of, all that great stuff. Now, Nuriel, we've sort of become allergic to recessions, allergic to economic shocks, allergic to volatility. Seems that we want to quell things more than ever. Every recession, every crisis, there's more added to the balance sheet, more extreme measures, bringing rates to zero, ballooning the, the balance sheet to $9 trillion. Now we're doing the treasury bills as a much greater share of issuance. What's going to happen when we actually have a recession? Right? What are our tools then? That's a very valid point. In some sense, we've used most of the bullets, both on the monetary side and on the fiscal side. The deficit is huge. Public debt as a share of GDP is high and rising. The balance sheet of the Fed, by the way, in spite of the current uh, quantity tightening, is uh, significantly trillions of dollars above what it was before COVID. And therefore, as you suggest, if there was another recession, can we increase further the balance sheet by trillions of dollars? Can we start running much larger fiscal deficits? I think that the risk is one, that the bond vigilantes are going to wake up. They're going to say, this is not sustainable on the fiscal side. And if instead you're trying to keep a lead on rates by doing then, again, amounts of QE, you could have uh, 
some unhinging of uh, inflation expectations. So either the debt becomes uh, less sustainable, bond yields are much higher, or if that doesn't happen by monetizing it, you're going to affect inflation and inflation expectation. So definitely, uh, while this policy might have been needed during the global financial crisis, uh, QE was continued until we started to reverse and normalize rates for almost a decade, until about 2017. And then during COVID, we doubled down on the same thing. So we are effectively running out of bullets. That's absolutely an important and valid point. So what about stocks? Last year, we had a great year, despite the monetary policy tightening that went on. This year, we had some hiccups recently, but we're still having a relatively good year. Let me look real quick to give an accurate figure. Up 13% year to date on the S&P 500. Still in August. Survived the carry trade. Steve Sosnick survived the VIX going to 65, somewhere around there. Right, where do stocks go from here? Some folks feel like we're front loaded. We're going to be sort of flat for, for a while. Other folks feel like we can keep running. And other folks think we can have a really sharp correction. Well, it's important to note that our paper doesn't make predictions about the stock market. What it does do is help us understand why the stock market has not collapsed in the face of an, an, an extremely aggressive Fed tightening cycle. And if you go back five years ago to before the pandemic, and you told people that, hey, the Fed was going to hike 500 plus basis points and do a QT, most people would probably say, hey, it probably means that there's going to be a huge financial crisis. And that hasn't happened, I think, to a lot of people's surprise. And when and we think that these innovative issuance strategies designed to loosen financial conditions from the Treasury Department help explain part of the reason why, right? Like this is, null this is nullified, this has stood in the way of a portion of, not all of, but of a portion of the Fed's tightening cycle to make it so that financial conditions are not as tight as they otherwise would be. So we think that, that this helps explain why stocks have been so strong over the last year or so. It doesn't really make a strong prediction for where stocks are going to be going in the near future. Yeah, I would add, however, that if the next administration, it doesn't matter whether it's Trump or Harris is going to win the election, if they were to term out this policy, then the additional issuance of long-term bonds and less of bills that will be needed to go back to the previous ratios, in our estimate would imply that the 10-year treasury yield would go up by about basis points for at least or two or three years. At the time where maybe the Fed is now starting to cut rates because uh, financial conditions have been tight for long enough that they are willing to do so. And that could have a potential impact on uh, equity prices, could have also an impact on the economy. In an extreme case, if the Fed is easing while the undoing of this ATI implies 50 basis points higher long rates, the economy could uh, stall or tip into a recession, whether it's short and shallow or more severe to be discussed. But there'll be a cost about undoing this policy or if whichever administration is in power and they decide they do not want to pay this cost, then this policy that was temporary, maybe before an election year, could become permanent. And if it were to become permanent, then the risk is, again, that you are ninja inflation expectation. You have eventually higher long rates was expected than actual inflation is higher. So in some sense, given what has been done now, the costs are going to be significant, whether you continue the policy or whether you're going to phase it out. So them if you do and them if you don't. Any optimal solutions at this jump? My last question, we can, Steve Sostick, after this one, you can ask one or sure, two more sure. if you'd like. But my last question is, any optimal solutions for policymakers at this juncture? Obviously, cutting spending isn't a popular thing to do. Neither is raising taxes. Well, you're suggesting that the country should find its way to a long-term fiscal sustainability, which is, which is very much optimal but in the very near term, at least, not too likely, as you say. With respect to specifically the debt management stuff, one, one point that we make, and that really is sort of one of the larger points of our paper, is that one has to pay attention not just to what the Fed or Treasury are doing in isolation, but 
to conceive of this as an overall policy portfolio and think about the Fed Treasury consolidated balance sheet as moving markets. You can't look at what the left hand is doing without also looking at what the right hand is doing. You have to sort of think about what they're both doing at the same time. And it would be best for Treasury to return to regular and predictable issuance as quickly as possible and to return to orthodox issuance policy and determine that debt as quickly as possible. And if that ends up tightening financial conditions in a way that makes it more difficult for the Fed to achieve its mandates, the Fed can offset that by adjusting interest rate policy. And if it turns that if it turns out the financial conditions tighten too much because Treasury creates a, a significant backup in the long end of yield curve, the Fed can address that by loosening policy uh, at the front end or adjusting its balance sheet policies elsewhere. Each organ should be paying attention to its own mandates rather than trying to get involved in the activities of the other organ. So we think that it is important to return to, to more orthodox policies as, as quickly as possible. And we think that investors, policymakers, academics, everyone really needs to be paying attention to what the left hand and the right hand are doing and make sure that the one isn't undoing what the other is doing. So. Steve Moran, if, do, if Dr. Yellen happened to join this call right now, would your last discussion be basically your elevator pitch to her? I think that she would prefer not to discuss the issue at all. She, their view, Treasury's view is that they're not doing anything out of the ordinary and that their effects don't, they don't dispute our claims that, you know, that their choices are affecting markets, but they maintain that they're not affecting markets in a way that counteracts what the Fed is doing. And I think that they would just wish that we would just go away. So I think she would prefer to get out of the elevator as quickly as she could. <laughs> the, by the way, if I may, e economists, as the non-economist on the call, economists get a bad name for being gloomy. And I will say, in, in my time knowing economists, the first one I got to know was the late Dr. Kaufman when I was at Solomon Brothers and I was friendly with his son. My, my next door neighbor, who I won't throw under the bus, is an economist. He's a really nice guy, but he's been known for making gloomy calls. It, 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 how much of it... it I, can you push back here and just say that this is just adding realism to it? You're, you're rather than taking a glass half empty view of the world. I think it's just being realistic. No. Well, you know, Dr. Kaufman was the first Dr. Doom. And then during the global financial crisis, yeah, I yeah. became uh, Dr. Doom. Uh, I earned the title, so I'm the new Dr. Doom, <laughs> but I usually say I'm not Dr. Doom. I'm Dr. Realist. You have to think about what are the downsides and what are the upsides. And there are plenty of downsides and plenty of upsides. And the upsides actually have all to do with having the right economic policies. Because I wrote a whole book, Mega Threats, about the things can go wrong. Mm -hmm. But for every threat and for every crisis, there is a policy solution. These policy solutions, however, require cost and sacrifices in the short run for the common good, nationally and globally, over the medium long term. And unfortunately, whether you're in a democracy or an authoritarian regime, it's very hard to do the policy changes or the structural reform that give us the benefits over time. And I wrote a whole book about uh, political cycles in the macroeconomy and how, regardless of whether you set the rights at the left, you try to boost the economy before the election, how both sides can try to manipulate or attempt to manipulate the independence of central banks on how there are partisan divisions Democrats like to spend, but they're willing or unable to raise taxes enough. And Republicans like to tax taxes, cut taxes, but they're unable or unwilling to cut spending enough. And therefore, we have these structural biases towards fiscal deficits, and then we have electoral business cycle as well. Unfortunately, those biases imply that uh, politicians look only about being popular or being reelected. They don't think about the medium long term. And unfortunately, we're on an unsustainable fiscal path and our policy on the monetary side, they've been essentially monetizing fiscal deficits in a way that eventually could become inflationary over the medium long term. So that's the realistic, it's not the doomish, but the realistic assessment of where we are, unfortunately. And I guess the final question that I have for you guys is last week at this time, we're taping this by the way, Monday the 12th. So last week at this time, the markets were in a tizzy and I, I, I won't bore either you guys are the listeners, but I believe it was much more the effect of the carry trade and some volatility trades blowing up rather than the recessionary call. But there were some people sort of pants on fire. We need to cut rates immediately and cut them quickly. And one of them was my former professor. So I really don't want to throw him under the bus, but I was a little dismayed at that. 
what do you think the right policy prescription is for the Fed? I, I, it seems to me that the rate cut picture is, especially after your paper, is much more murky than it seems. Do you? What is your just general gut feel? Do we? How aggressively does the Fed need to cut rates, if at all? So I don't know. I mean, it's even possible that Nuriel and I disagree on this question. From my perspective, and I'm happy to let him give his also, but from my perspective, there is an argument for some adjustment cuts given the move in the unemployment rate, as well as inflation has come down a little bit. I don't think the size of the adjustment cuts that we need is enormous. And I think that the adjustment cuts have already in large part been provided by the Treasury Department through ATI, right? There was an argument for adjustment cuts earlier this year, right? It just so happens those adjustment cuts were delivered in the form of reduced term premium and reduced tenure yields rather than reductions in the overnight rate. So my perspective is that was that inflation still ran quite high in the first half, 3.3% core PCE inflation in the first half of the year. GDP growth is, was 2.8% in the second quarter. The Atlanta Fed now cast is around 2.9% for the third quarter. And it's still early in the quarter, but that's still quite high. Right. And so I'm far from I'm far from convinced that, that the inflationary demon is truly slain, adorably slain. And so while I do think there is some scope for some adjustment cuts, some insurance driven reductions to the Fed's policy rate, I think we need to incorporate the stimulus that's been provided through Treasury's activist Treasury issuance. But perhaps Nouriel has different views on, on inflation and employment than I do. Please share. I'll only point out that there's Steve Slotnik pointed out the unraveling of the carry trade in yen were driven by the fact that the BOJ decided, not fully unexpected, to raise a little bit another 15 basis points its policy rate and cut its QE by half over the next couple of years. They're still doing, by the way, QE, just that the labor is a tapering of their QE. And that led a massive market shock that became global, together, of course, with some concerns about the U.S. economic growth stalling, but I would agree the volatility was driven by this unwinding of the carry trade. But that implies that, you remember, in 2013, when the Fed started to talk about tapering, there was a taper tantrum. And this time around, there was another taper tantrum coming from the BOJ. Now, suppose next year, whoever's in power decides to term out this issue. We think that the markets are not fully aware of the impact that this policy has had on yields and on asset prices. So there could be a market shock. Now, Steve correctly points out that if that market shock were to occur, then the Fed can always ease more to undo it. But as uh, we point out, Treasury and the Fed have different roles. The Fed is in charge of the business cycle, dual mandate on growth, employment, and inflation. The fiscal policy is supposed to do what fiscal policy does, decided by elected officials and so on. Fiscal policy has a role in the business cycle only when there is a recession. Of course, you want to do countercyclical fiscal stimulus, but it's not the job of the Treasury to affect financial condition by using actively, essentially, debt management to do so, because that interferes with monetary policy. And unfortunately, in the last decade, as we've gone to unconventional fiscal monetary policies and credit policy, totally unconventional ones, the distinction between fiscal policy, semi-fiscal monetary and credit policy has been blurred in a way that has risks over the medium long term, especially in a world in which there are larger deficits that have to be eventually monetized, and that can lead to really a unraveling of inflation expectations. So we're playing a bit of a dangerous game and we are not realizing that these policies have long-term consequences with meaningful negative side effects. Yeah, and it seems that the um, the bar for the inflation doves has been really low at a low 4%. Uh, and, you know, the CPI this week is expected to come in right at 3%. Folks have been pretty happy with that in your rail, Steve Moran, Steve Sosnick. Folks have been cheering the disinflation the whole year, even though in many short-term periods, when you annualize those figures well above central bank targets, not just stateside, but all over the world. Uh, thank you so much, Stephen Moran, Nuriel Rubini of Hudson Bay Capital, Steve Sostick, my co-host uh, here at Interactive Brokers. I'm Jose Torres. Please like this podcast, subscribe, and feel free to check out our other ones. Thank you.
Thanks for having us. Thank you so much. The analysis in this material is provided for information only and is not and should not be construed as an offer to sell or the solicitation of an offer to buy any security. To the extent that this material discusses general market activity, industry, or sector trends, or other broad-based economic or political conditions, it should not be construed as research or investment advice. To the extent that it includes references to specific securities, commodities, currencies, or other instruments, those references do not constitute a recommendation by IBKR to buy, sell or hold such investments. This material does not and is not intended to take into account the particular financial conditions, investment objectives or requirements of individual customers. Before acting on this material, you should consider whether it is suitable for your particular circumstances, and as necessary, seek professional advice.